Hello, it's Ken Gaddy with the YouTube channel GameBits with this week's Indie Cider, where I play indie games and then interview the developers. I'm here to show you one of the most unusual games I've ever put on my YouTube channel, that being to be or not to be. That is, of course, the most famous line from the most famous play by the most famous playwright, William Shakespeare's Hamlet. It was adapted into an original Choose Your Own Path style book, an actual dead tree paper book, by Mr. Ryan North of Dinosaur Comics. He went on Kickstarter a few years ago and raised over half a million dollars to create this book. And then just recently, February 2015, Tin Man Games adapted it into an actual digital game that you can download from Steam for Mac, Windows, or Linux for $12. It is... If you ever played the Choose Your Own Adventure books that you had as a kid, it's a lot like that. I'm skipping over a lot of the introductory text. However, this is not very much like Shakespeare, not as he would have intended it. He is probably rolling over in his grave, because this game is written in modern English, and there's a lot of humor to it. Congratulations on being born. Not surprised, babies are boring, so we're just going to jump ahead in your life. And we're skipping over everything that was really dull. So at the very beginning of the game, you get to ch actually choose your character, Ophelia. Plus one bonus of science, minus one weakness against water. Ooh, too soon. Hamlet, an emo teen in his early 30s. Plus one resistance to magic, but there's no magic in this adventure, so this never gets mentioned again as of right now. Or Hamlet Sr., the good king of Denmark, 50 years old. Well, if you've read Hamlet, you know how that story ends. It's not well. The skull indicates what choice Shakespeare made when he wrote this book. So you can just follow along with the original narrative if you want, or you can do something a little bit more offbeat. You'll notice that the soundtrack changed to adapt to the choice that I made. Right, you're Ophelia. You are a beautiful and independent young woman, and although it makes you roll your eyes when you think about it, you've fallen in love with a prince. Prince Hamlet is funny and charming, and he seems to like you a lot. You try not to get too excited about it because you're worried you might jinx it, but things are really going great. You know, instead of me reading this text to you, I can let the game talk to you. I'm going to go into font and sound and turn narration on. And I'm going to briefly stop speaking to you so I can let the game speak for itself. Right, you're Ophelia. You are a beautiful and independent young woman, and although it makes you roll your eyes when you think about it, you've fallen in love with a prince. Prince Hamlet is funny and charming, and he seems to like you a lot. You try not to get too excited about it, because you're worried you might jinx it. But things really are going great. Only... Only it's been hard doing the long distance thing while you've both been off at university. And while you've loved studying capital S science, and you're sure Hamlet's love studying capital U undeclared, it hasn't been easy. Now that you're both back together in Denmark for his father's funeral and his mother's second wedding, it's been harder still. Hamlet's really sad, and you can't blame him for that since, you know, his dad died. But you wish there was something you could do to help him. When you last saw him, Hamlet mentioned how the castle seemed cold and drafty, and for some reason it stuck with you. You've been sitting at your desk, trying to think of something you could give him that would help with that. A way of cheering him up a little. Remind him he's still got people who care about him. He wears these cloaks all the time, but then he's taking them off in warm rooms and putting them back on in cold ones. If only there was some way you could keep the rooms at a uniform temperature, he wouldn't need to be constantly adjusting his clothes throughout the day. But to do that, you'd need some way of measuring heat, and a way of transporting it through the castle, perhaps through a series of pipes. Your thoughts are interrupted by a knock at your door. Who is it? You call. It's me, says your brother. Come on, let me in. So that is the narration. It's pretty humorous, his inflections and choices. But I'm going to turn it back off now. You can also turn the sound off, the music off, etc. I'll show you some of those other features later. There are extras. You, you can get achievements by the various choices that you make. And there are multiple deaths. If you've ever read Hamlet, then it shouldn't surprise you that practically every choice in this game leads to a death. However, each death is illustrated by a different artist, including the creators of such web comics as XKCD, Adventure Time, let's see, what else? Penny Arcade. Whoa, look at all these. 
Okay, I'm going to show you the death where you choose Hamlet Sr. So this is the art I got for that. Ooh, sexy ghost beach volleyball tournament this way. Wait, wait, no, 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 undo. I meant to say that being a ghost is super cool and I want to stay. Poof. Too late. So that was the very first death I achieved. There are lots to choose from. And this is who created it. That's the credit for that. So back to the arty bits. Main menu. Back to story. Checkpoints. That lets you skip back to any choice you previously made. So just like when you were playing Choose Your Own Adventure books, and you stuck your finger in a certain page so you could always go back to it and figure out what would have happened if it had you made a different choice. Oh dear. Skip ahead. There we go. You can do the same thing in this game. Anyway, you got the gist of it. It's a lot of reading, which is not the best way to show you a game because you're listening to me, you're reading the text, there are a lot of words, you're being distracted. So I'm just gonna go ahead and keep playing this game while I add even more voices to this video. I'm gonna be interviewing two of the developers from Tin Man Games. They are the studio in Melbourne, Australia, who adapted Ryan North's book based on William Shakespeare's play into the game you are now seeing on YouTube channel GameBits. Did you follow that? Good, because there will be a quiz at the end. No, this is not high school English. I was not great at Shakespeare to begin with. However, if you simply want to listen to the audio version of the interview, go ahead and go to IndieCider.net, and you can download an audio podcast for iTunes, Stitcher, or TuneIn, or using your favorite podcatcher. So with that said, thanks so much for watching, and let's get to the interview. Today I'm speaking with Ben Cosmina, producer at Tin Man Games, and Kamina Vincent, QA tester and community manager at Tin Man Games, all the way in Melbourne, Australia. Hello. Hello! Hello! You are way too excited for a Monday morning. <laughs> I've had two cups of tea. I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> Is every day at Tin Man Games this exciting? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yes, it is. And then sometimes I remember some of the things. <laughs> it's like, but no, it's really, really great. I love it. This is my first job in the games industry, and it's just awesome. Like you're, Ben and Clinton are great to work with. And... You're, you're you're coping well. I like it. I, I, yeah. I am. It's been lots of fun. Yeah. No, I really enjoy working at Tin Man, and every day is really awesome. So wonderful. I've enjoyed playing your game, and it's very unusual, not just in the format being IF, but also in its content being. A Shakespeare game. It's really hard, in my opinion and in my experience, to make Shakespeare fun. And so I'm wondering, who is your target audience for this game? Would you say it's more Shakespeare scholars who really appreciate the Bard's work, or is it people like me who are more <laughs> Shakespeare detractors who will take any opportunity to see him made fun of? I think if you're a Shakespeare, like a super Shakespeare enthusiast, you might actually cry a little because you turn into the Hulk at one point as Hamlet. <laughs> so sometimes you don't really stick within the laws of reason and physics. Yeah, I think I think if you have familiarity with Shakespeare, um, you'll you probably enjoy this a lot because you'll you'll you you know you'll uh, you'll flick open the start of the book and it's like oh Ophelia's got a weakness to water ha, ha, ha. and yeah. you can choose to play as Hamlet senior I wonder what will happen you know early on when I played this when I was doing testing for this book I gave it to my parents and my mum knows Shakespeare and my dad doesn't and so there was the option I was reading it out to them and I gave okay, them the option to choose from you know Ophelia Hamlet or a King Hamlet and I let dad make all the choices because we thought it would be more fun that way and so dad chose uh, Hamlet, King Hamlet because you know he sounds amazing and mum tried to stifle back and giggle <laughs> as soon as that happened so yeah hilarity ensued yeah so like, yeah I, I quite like Shakespeare a lot like mm. watching I can't remember what it's called Taming of the Shrew possibly yeah and some of the insults he comes up with but this is great because if you have that knowledge of Shakespeare you can take a bit more out of yeah the parts and the choices that are made but. yeah well I can tell you as well now that now that the game's out I didn't know Hamlet from you know starting to starting to work on those like Hamlet was not one of the ones I was familiar with mm. I think I'd done oh what was it uh, the Pound of Flesh one the, uh, uh, with Shylock the Merchant of Venice Merchant of Venice yeah. yeah I'd done that but not Hamlet and so essentially this was my crash, crash course in Hamlet and I told Ryan that later I was like oh wow <laughs> 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 well, one of the things I really enjoyed about To Be or Not To Be is how accessible and how readable it is. And I know that that's more the work of the author, Ryan North, but yeah. it's very much written in modern English as opposed to ancient English. Yeah, mm. that's helped a lot, I think. Um, just 
being able to decipher what what people's motivations are and what <laughs> what's actually going on is is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and no. there's occasionally the um, certain speeches which are like as as they are, but it's yeah, simple. yeah. But no, it's it's really good. I think mm. updating it that way, and it's got its own sense of humor. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, but, but being able to adapt it to to a game format as well, take it and just making it so it's really easy to get into and and play through. Um, one of the other things with the, you may notice with the with the engine we've got um, for this one is that all the all the te- all the text is presented in blocks. This was because it's based off the appointment with Fear engine, which had like you know very comic book style sort of thing. But um, we found that. What was really good about that is that um, we had, due to the way that the engine was designed, we had to keep uh, text into small blocks um, about the length of a Twitter uh, tweet. Twitter tweet. <laughs> <laughs> about the length of a tweet so that um, you could you could read them and absorb them um, mm. e- enough. Um, it, it, yeah, that's it does make it a lot easier rather than just seeing a wall of text. And yeah. it does make it more accessible because we do have a dyslexic font in there and breaking it up also helps. Yeah, that's right. With ease of readability. Yes, yeah. And also that the um, there's no colour blindness problems or things like yeah, that. No yeah, no colour-based choices. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. You know, I noticed the font choice of dyslexic, but I wasn't really sure I understood what that meant. Can you explain it to us? Basically, there is a, um, a font type which, which we found out about Thanks to okay. Ian Hamilton, he does a lot of accessibility yeah. work in the UK. And yeah. Apple, and he gave a talk in Melbourne. And yeah, so Ben started looking into it. I wasn't in Tin Man at that point, <clears> but Ben started looking into it. Yeah. And it's weighted heavier at the bottom, so the letters don't float around and move places. Yeah. So it's um it's it's designed essentially so that if you if you have that, uh, dyslexia, you can, you, well, you can read it. Mm. You, you don't you don't have um issues with the with the um the text. That's really interesting. I was not familiar with that. Thank you. Yeah. So adapting a essentially a choose your own adventure book. I know that choose your own adventure is a trademark title, but that's also generically used as a genre. <laughs> Chooseable path adventure is the um, term we t- we've been using. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> so adapting a book like that into interactive fiction is that the right name for what you would call this game, interactive fiction? Um, I, I mean, I suppose so because. It, you know, when you think about it, that's basically what it is, isn't it? You rather you, rather than typing in your your choices, you know, you're you're taking the you're taking a, a sort of more streamlined step mm. in the same way that like you know the earlier graphic adventures like um, uh, King's Quest, you know, you were able to type in commands and stuff like that. But then later on, they streamlined it to um, to icons. So I suppose it's kind of similar to that in a sense. Okay, so what sort of unique challenges or opportunities did you encounter in adapting a print work into a game book? Oh, <laughs> Ryan does interesting things. <laughs> there's, there's certain, I, I, I love the guy, there's, there's certain times going through the book you'll find stuff and it's like, oh, why, why? did you do this to us? <laughs> like, there's like the amazing section where um uh where where the author asks King Hamlet a hypothetical question about the potential career choices you can have, and it is literally two pages of, of potential links which all lead to the same place, and our engine just it it works best with four, <laughs> so we had to think of a more creative um way to handle that. I think in the end, I ended up doing something like. Listing all the um, the uh, choices, listing all the careers, and in the choice options, it was something like the link changed to something like Ryan. I am not writing all these choices out. <laughs> like, yeah, wasn't there also a section you could only get to by actually physically turning the oh, pages? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's that's actually something that will only be in the book, um, the physical book. There's a secret section where you can um, uh, end up in space, uh, in like a, a space futury themed thing where you um yeah, and you can literally only get it by flicking through the book and finding it the volume choices there and we had a um a sort of random number generator that would um send you to that randomly send you to that area but um it just it just didn't really work with the flow of the book and ryan's just like it's cool just cut it so we did the end yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
There was an old, was it a fighting fantasy book that did that as well? The only way to get to the good ending was to flip through the whole page. Uh, no, page. that was a that was a choose your own adventure oh, it book. Was a- it was really cool. Um, this was like a, a space choose your own adventure book, and um, there, at the start of it, it says something like, uh, "There, are, there is a place you cannot you you cannot reach through through any traditional means. Uh, it is utopia." Blah 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 blah. Can you find the way to get there, or something like that? And you have to flick through there. You have to flip through the book and find the thing, and it's this wonderful description of um, utopia, and it says something along the lines of, um, you, you know, you found a you found a wonderful secret, and it wouldn't be a good secret if you couldn't return here any time you like, so you can enter and leave whenever you like. And it's like, awesome. wow. <laughs> See, that's just how I read the books anyway. After I ran out of fingers for bookmarks, I just kind of read from cover to cover. Oh man, me too. <laughs> This is the same game engine as your other game books. For example, I played an assassin in Orlandis previously. Is this the same engine? No, this is um completely different from that engine. So, assassin in Orlandis uses a um uh, our previous book engine, which is more uh, traditional book format. You can probably see, um, but this one is based off the one which came out in in June, June or July last year, called Appointment with Fear, and that was more comic book based. Um, where blocks of text would slide in and dynamically um, uh, slide off, and it would, yeah, the the whole thing reads pretty much like a like a Twitter feed. Mm. So we've got a couple of different engines depending on the book. That's right. Yeah, and we we try to find something that's more um, adaptable and suitable for that that one. This one's um this engine is newer, so it's got a lot of cool stuff, but it's still you know it hasn't had like six years worth of iteration, <laughs> so we're yeah. still finding some kinks through it. Was the decision to adapt Ryan North's work into a game book, was that something that he approached you or you approached them? Because I remember seeing the Kickstarter when it was running back in December of 2012, and nowhere in there as a stretch goal is any sort of a digital edition or an interactive edition even mentioned. So whose idea was this? I believe it was uh, our our creative creative director, uh, Neil, who um, got in touch with Ryan. So this would have been mid or early last yeah. year, yeah, and they they um, worked out the details through there. Um, yeah, it was early last year because I just started and I was yeah. super excited by it. And I, yeah, and that was around the same time I saw the art popping up in the directories, and I was just like, "Wow, oh, I'm <laughs> gonna be on, on this one." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, it's a, it, yeah, it wasn't related to the Kickstarter at all. It was um, something that they they worked out between them. It's interesting that you mentioned that this was early to mid last year, 2014, because at one point the narrator says that he is recording his vocal track in March of 2013. So I don't know if that was some sort of a just a meta awareness that was fictionalized or what. I, I assume that the game had been in the works for two years. Well, the the audio track is actually um, so that was originally a Kickstarter exclusive. So that would have been done for the Kickstarter. So previously, this was only the, the the narration was only available to Kickstarter, but now it's available to the the the, the PC Mac and Linux version. <laughs> yeah, so it's the first time it's been accessible to a wider audience. Are the Kickstarter backers frustrated that hey, this was ours, now everybody can have it? I'd like to think that everyone's happy to share. Yeah, I would like think they so had too. early access to it and supposed to. That's it, and yeah. um, I know Ryan. He when. When the game came out, he sent like he sent like a Kickstarter message um, saying like you know the game's the game's out. You don't have you don't have to buy it because you know you already own the book. But um, if if you want to, you can do that. And also, um, the first fifty people to get in touch with me will get a, a key for it. So, you know, like uh, it's I think it was nice. I'd like to think we could share our toys. Yeah, <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> Another comparison between the Dead Tree edition and the digital edition is that the print edition has a cover price of $28.95 and the digital edition, which has many more features, interactivity, a soundtrack, a vocal track, is less than half that price at $11.99. And yet, mm. co- when you compare it to its competition on Steam, not just other IF, but other games that have high-res graphics, you know, 1080p of soundtrack and online multiplayer, some people mm. might find 11.99 to be a lot for a game that is mostly text. So how do yeah. you, how how do you settle on the pricing, or if people are critical, how do you justify the pricing? Yeah, pricing is always a tricky issue. And the thing is, um, I think basically uh, we've we've got to like gauge it 
based on what it is rather than basing it on things that are not the same thing. You know, it's it, it is what it is. It's it's not a it's not a multiplayer shooter. It's not a like a. It's, it's not, not going to make a billion dollars in its first day, which yeah. like Call of Duty can do and things like that. Yeah, it's not that kind of game. As much as we love them to be a lot more mainstream, these games are they they have a niche audience, and um, as a result of that, you know, it's we 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 think it's better to to be a bit more realistic realistic about it. Um, you know, these it. it it costs a lot of time and, and effort and money to make these things. So, um, yeah, and and as you say, you know, it's like half the price of the, um, or even less of the That's the actual print book edition, which is pretty cool, I think, considering, you know, it's it's um it's a really well written book, you know, um, it's you know it's not not just in terms of proofreading and things like that. It's really funny. It's it's genuinely funny. It's um. Uh, really deep there's a lot of different endings it's uh got a lot of a lot of kinds of humor um and there's like a whole lot of different high quality artwork from a lot of well-known artists which is you know pretty awesome and as as we mentioned as well like, like this is the first time that the narration has been fully fully available as well so there's that to take into account as well then there's like um all the kind of stuff like Getting ready the PC edition, the Mac edition, the Linux edition, and get, uh, preparing all the assets and, uh, and and hooking up all the stuff for achievements and trading cards and all that kind of stuff. So all t- all together, yeah, it's pretty. There's a, there's a, a long and short of it is there's a lot of work to do and a lot of effort that goes into these things and so a lot of love. Yeah, and so that's that's why it is. No, I agree that the race to the bottom that we're seeing in a lot of the gaming market, on one hand, it's great for the gamers because they can get a lot of entertainment for a very small amount of money, and it's great for some of the developers because, you know, if they can sell a thousand games for a buck each, that's more that's better than selling fifty games for you know, three dollars each. But at, at the same time, it can be so hard to be competitive when you are actually pricing something not at what will sell but at what it's actually worth. Consumers are starting to lose the sense for what these things are actually worth, and this game is worth $12. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. You know, we, we did, we, we argued a lot about, about this kind of thing, but it is, it is, it is worth that. Like, like I was saying, it's, it's something that is, it's a good, it's a good story. It's, um, it's really funny, mm. you know, and there's a lot of cool stuff in it. You mentioned the many different assets that are available in this book, and that comes from a lot of different parties that are involved. I can assume that Shakespeare didn't have much input into this project. <laughs> the time zone's a little different with Shakespeare. He's a <laughs> couple of hundred years. <laughs> but nonetheless, he was based in England. The author now, Ryan North, is based in Canada. His publisher for the Dead Tree edition, Bread Pig, is based in Boston. Yeah. So how, how many chefs were in this kitchen? We were lucky in that we came in at the end, so yeah. we didn't have to deal with a lot of that. Um, yeah, so it was really just, uh, it was uh, pretty much just directly, me directly emailing Ryan back and forth. And um, he's been he's been awesome to work with. Um, as you know, we, we kick around ideas and things and things like that, and I'll send him, a, send him a, uh, builds of the game, and he's so so positive and receptive of it as it, as it was coming along. Um, he would give feedback, and you know there was uh, there was a lot of a lot of great ideas from him and stuff that we just didn't think of, like um, the ability to uh, skip forward to a choice um, was his suggestion, and we were like, huh. That's really good. Let's <laughs> let's do that. Especially and, for me as a tester. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, like that. It's not like a print book, and you can't just jump to a page that you want to. You know, it's a, it's a bit different in that aspect. So being able to jump to a choice because you've like, oh, it's like, all right, this is funny, but I've already read this bit. I want to mm. go to a choice and choose something else. Is a really good work compromise. Yeah. So um, that was that was really um, some really good feedback that he gave mm. uh, gave us. Kamina, what were some of the other challenges that you encountered in testing this? <laughs> the narration I had to go through and check every single section <laughs> to make sure it had the right narration and it matched up to a certain point. So that skip button came in handy there because I had to go through the same, the start so many times to get we're, to... We're pretty, com- we're pretty confident it's, it's working. Out. <laughs> <laughs> it better be, otherwise I'll, be, I'll stop crying. How many hours of narration would you say that there are in this game? 
Uh, well, considering the book is a full-on tome, um, oh, I, I don't know how many hours I've played it on Steam. But yeah, I know I, I know there's like nearly 500 uh, files worth of. of yeah, um, I think of, I'm up to 100 plus hours on my Steam account, yeah. and then there's another work Steam account that I've been using that's a couple hundred hours. Yeah, so, so it's it adds up. It's not brief. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. No, it was a lot of fun. Like just finding because I had to check every single section, just finding a new section and going through that was really, really a lot of fun. Yeah. Um yeah, well, actually that does happen a lot. So Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I really like what he's done to Hamlet. <laughs> What he's done to Hamlet. Not with Hamlet, but to Hamlet. <laughs> with Hamlet. With Hamlet. Sorry. No, I, I was a kid that actually really loved studying Shakespeare at school. Now, <laughs> uh, the previous game book that I played, as I mentioned in Assassin in Orlandes, I played that on my iPad, but To Be or Not To Be is available from Mac, Windows, and Linux. Are we going to be seeing mobile editions of it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, just uh, in, this, in this instance, um, we really wanted to focus on the PC, Mac, and Linux ones first, and then um, tackle the uh, other ones so that we could make sure that they're the best that they are, and there's no weird mobile bugs that um, could happen if, we're, if we release everything simultaneously. Mm. Um, it's just we're... It adds to the programmer's workload. Yeah. We've got one programmer. One, one programmer at the moment. And then, I, like, for me to be able to test... Like iOS, Android, Linux, Mac, PC. Yeah, and it, things are things are gonna slip through otherwise. If yeah. that's the case, so we just we've got to stay in them a little bit this time. Once those additions come out, this game will be the beneficiary of both mobile gaming and crowdfunding, which are two of the tools that have democratized game publication and allowed these niche products to exist. Whether you compare this game to interactive fiction like Infocom made or point-and-click adventures like King's Quest, as you mentioned earlier, Mm. those are two genres that have very much faded from the limelight. Their heyday was 20, 30 years ago. Uh, but apparently it's true. Tin Man Games is evidence that you can make your living in these genres. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've been doing it for about six years now, so mm. it, we, we seem to still be okay. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's really yeah. great. And like, also at PAX and things like that, it'll have um, people coming up. It's like, I remember reading these as a kid. Oh, I yeah. really love it. Yeah. And it is interesting because I am younger than some of the some books. Of the books that <laughs> And yeah, it's just so just bluff your way through. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, after testing, I know everything about every book that I've ever worked on. Oh. Yeah, and, um, yeah. I think there is that resurgence because it's the people who grew up with them are now adults, and they can touch it. They have the buying power. Mm, that's so it. we buy what we feel nostalgic about. Yeah. It's really good because, like, I'll get parents coming in. They're like, I read this as a kid, and it's great because I'm reading with my kids now on yeah. my iPad, and they're really enjoying it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> there have been some really great stories from um, from people that we get. Yeah, like like Cam saying, family family people playing together you know, mm. with their kids, which is awesome. Cause that's introducing them to um, to this kind of stuff and, and getting them to read, which is, um, I think that was one of the things about the the particularly the fighting fantasies um originally which is like you know it's like a a secret way of getting past people uh, kids who don't want to read you know mm. it's like oh well it's not really a book it's a it's an adventure that you get to take you know yeah and it's like oh but we, but there's reading involved <laughs> don't don't look at that <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So you know, there were there were all these. Um, there's there's been a lot of a lot of positive uh, a lot of positive feedback we've gotten from, yeah. from a lot of people, which is and excellent. If you look at it, like the Telltale games, mm. which like, yeah, but they're kind of have, that yeah. interactive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like um, Walking Dead is like uh, I've only had a had a chance to play the um first episode and of the first season. The first season, my God, there's two seasons now. <laughs> but yeah, like that was incredibly distressing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, what was the other one? Wolf Among Us. I really yeah. liked that one. That was... Game's around this one now. Yeah, I, I heard that was interesting. And most recently we have Life is Strange, which just came out last month and is very similar to those titles. I haven't played that. I'm, I'm so behind on my gaming. Which, which one was this one? Life is Strange? Life is Strange. Someone was okay. saying it was good. Oh, okay. Um, I yeah. haven't looked at that one yet. I've been too busy. <laughs> 
Uh, Kamina, you've been to PAX East, and of course now Australia has its own PAX. How do you demo a game like this? Do people at PAX on the show floor actually want to stop and take the time to read? Yeah. I am so glad you asked this question. <laughs> they really do. Like, uh, it's not just the people who remember reading it as a kid. They, like, people will come by and we'll have several iPads, we'll have a laptop playing a video, we've got two TVs yeah. that people can then click through. Yeah. Appointments fee it did change. My God. Um, like, previously, previous years, you know, imagine trying to show someone a book, a book. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just and yeah and then you know we had uh, we had last year um appointment with fear which is like the most the silliest uh 60s batman um superhero superhero adventure you've got and the first thing that happens is like choose your character design your character choose your silly name you know and it really gets them into the into the spirit of the thing and they were having loads of fun yeah um you know and and again because it's all short they're all short little snippets of text that happen at, at times and then you get into combat or make a choice or something like that it's all really quick mm. um it just helps so much rather than just like reading slabs of text in, yeah. in, in one go i think the fact that it also looks different to everything else yeah. draws people's eyes yeah that, um yeah. but yeah there were times where it was like huge lines it's like we need to get these people to stop yeah playing. but they were having so much fun and it was because everyone goes to pack like not everyone but a lot of people go to packs with their friends so we'd have groups of people all looking over their mate's shoulders yeah. playing it yelling at him, him or her which choice to to make, yeah which yeah. choice do you want to make that's um, it and so yeah it became a very interactive like experience. friends <laughs> co-op experience yeah kind of. yeah i'm really looking forward to seeing to be being uh, demoed at a, at a con because oh, be that's going to be hilarious i would love that yeah and when is that going to happen certainly it does because it's like just down the road from us. <laughs> it's a 15 um, minute walk. Um, yeah. We, we're hoping Prime. We'd like to be at crossed, Prime. Fingers crossed, fingers yeah. crossed. I'd really love to go to Prime. The, th the thing is that um, it's, you know, it's the distance and the, and the, and the money. Uh, unfortunately, you know, like uh, we do, we do get assistance from government grants, which are fantastic. Mm -hmm. But um, at, unfortunately, for this year, it had kind of the that that particular grant had had run out. So we have to wait for the next financial year, which is around the same time as prior. Yeah. So hopefully we can get it. Yeah, fingers crossed. I'd love to do that. Yeah, but, but despite the distance and the remote geography, Australia seems to be a hotbed for gaming. I've previously interviewed on this podcast uh, Sion Rosenblum from Three Sprockets and Adrian Moore from Love Shack. And I'm hosting a panel at PAX East about empathy games. And Nicole Stark from Disparity Games got a travel grant to come to PAX East and speak. Yeah, no, Australia's doing really well. We had, um, when the GFC hit, we actually had quite a few large studios up in Brisbane. Um, and then oh, they, down here, they all just oh, closed. Oh, yeah, they just yeah. closed. It kept happening. And, um, yeah. But from that, we've got a lot of indie studios who yeah. have grown. And so it's really great. Yeah, I'm so glad Sian's doing well. Um, Fight the Dragon sounds like it's I'm, coming I'm on I'm so great. glad everyone who was previously yeah. mentioned is yeah, doing well. Yeah. But no, like, I, I've worked with Sian before. Like, um, and he's he's very passionate about what he does. Mm. Um, and Sparry, we've, you know, we've walked into them. They're... Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's there's so many so many, you, you just you just keep bumping into people, you know. But but um the guys from Wanda down here, um there's um, Mellows in um, the uh, yeah, Mellows upstairs. Um the screen cheat guys are here. Um there's yeah. Well, we are working in the arcade, which is like a shared games company. It's yeah. Space. So so it, it's it's kinda like um where all the indies go when PAX isn't on. <laughs> You mentioned how passionate Sion is, but I think that's true of almost anybody in indie games because nobody goes into indies to make it rich. <laughs> 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 hey, I went into publishing. I know how it is. <laughs> yeah. 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 One last question. I played To Be or Not To Be, the, and the first time I played it, I died almost immediately. I, like, I didn't even, I, I chose to not choose a character, and they're like, wow, oh. you, you fail at reading. Try again. Uh, the second time I played as Hamlet Senior, that did not end well, as you can imagine. Yeah. But but the, but the third time, I thought I got a pretty good ending. I played as Ophelia, and I married Hamlet, and I invented central heating, which was pretty yep. cool. And yet, it is cool. And yet, <laughs> literally. And yet, the the the, the, the heat the rating system at the end of the game gave me the lowest score possible. So what does it take to win Hamlet? Follow the skulls. Yeah. That, the Hamometer shows you how accurate you are to the story of Hamlet. 
the original. So if you follow the if you follow the Yorick skulls, you'll get the um, you'll get a a two B rating. But okay. if you um if you go on your off your on your own path, you'll you'll um vary based on the skulls you find. It's not bad. It's just um you're not Hamlet. Yeah. Because yeah, I, know, you, I know enough Shakespeare to know that if I follow the skulls, I don't get a happy ending. <laughs> no. Well, you get the correct ending. It depends on your perspective, really. <laughs> if, if you want to avenge yourself and kill the entire court of Denmark, and that's your life goal, then you achieve your life goal. I just gave away the massive spoiler. <laughs> Hamlet is quite old, though, so... It's like 400 years old. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I think the statute of limitations has expired on that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. Too soon. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, it's 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 a really fun game. It's unique. I've enjoyed it, and I've enjoyed speaking with you as well. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, anything you want to add to our listeners, or anything you want to let them know where to find you or your game? Yeah. So you can find uh, our game books on GameBookAdventures.com. Yep. Yeah. Um, and on Steam, on Humble. Yeah. Um, soon to be iOS and Android. Yeah. Once we once we got that already <laughs> coffee helps and yeah I'm, I'm glad you've enjoyed it and i hope everyone does enjoy it yeah um we've gotten a, a good response from people so far which is great and so yeah please please tell us you like our games it helps it makes us feel better it does we're, we're, we're very needy our self-esteem needs constant stroking <laughs> please please like us <laughs> i like you very much so thank you so much for your time thanks for no having worries, us Ken. thanks so much 